First of all, thank you for joining me on yet, another mind, opening video regarding the occult, ancient, lost and hidden history, as well as esoteric knowledge. In my previous video, I have declared, to make my next video based on the children of the Norse god Odin. Keep in mind, that this video will be vaguely based, of the audiobook, The Children of Odin, and the Book of Northern Myths. In this video presentation, I am going to attempt to show my viewers, which of the seven main deities, have been revered as creator gods and goddesses worldwide, starting in ancient Sumer, and making its way into all the other major empires that came thereafter. The viewers will also see some unmistakable connections between the Aesir gods and goddess from northern myths and the Tua de Danon, also known as the tribe or people of the goddess Danu. If you have not been aware, that most children's fairy tales are based off the stories of the Book of Northern Myths and the godlike beings classed as the Aesir and the Vanir deities, then it will come as a shocking surprise that these fairy tales portrayed in Hollywood, had a very sinister origin, one that is far from the Hollywood version that is brainwashing our kinds today, with fairies, sorcery and paying homage to the ancient Sumer, Babylonian and Northern deities. I hope you are ready to have your eyes further opened, and your mind expanded as we delve deeper into the ancient creation deities, the fairies of folklore, the Tuatha de Danon, the gentry, ascended masters and a Freemasonic fictional book called Ididorfa that may very well be hiding Aphrodite in the bowels of the earth. So, let's begin. In my previous video, I have done a rough background, on the Norse creation myth, in this one, I wish to elaborate a bit more on the Norse creation myth, and direct most of my viewers' attention, towards Autumbla, the cosmic cow of the Norse creation myth. The reason for the focus on the cosmic cow, in this video, is to show my viewers, that amongst all of the other gods and goddesses of the past civilizations, there is one deity, that can prove the link, between the Sumerian, Egyptian, Babylonian, East Asian, Northern, Greek, Roman and even Celtic deities, and creation myths and legends. In my previous video, I have already shown the link, between Althumbla the Celestial Cow and the Milky Way. In many of the creation myths, according to various cultures, tribes, countries and ancient civilizations, the Celestial Cow has been linked to the primordial waters of creation and the first gods. Even the four rivers of the Milky Way has been referred to as the rivers of milk on which Immer the frost giant and Buri the predecessor of the Aesir gods fed on, thus stating Aldumbla the celestial cow nourish both the sky gods and the frost giants of chaos. This is very similar to the Babylonian creation myth of Enuma Eilish, whereby Tiamat, the sea dragon goddess, is the mother, of the Anunnaki gods, as well as the demons of chaos. One finds this same connection of primordial mother goddess of waters, within the Egyptian pantheon, whereby Hathor, the cow goddess once nourished Horus on her udders. Not only, was Hathor associated with the celestial cow, fertility, hunting and primordial waters of creation, but so too was Namu, the Sumerian creation mother and primordial goddess of the Sumerian pantheon. According to the Sumerian creation myth Namu was the primordial mother that gave birth to the first senior gods. She was associated with the primordial sea waters, just like Tiamat. Like Immer from the Norse creation myth, Tiamat was also killed by the gods and the world was created from his remains, thus, both Immer and Tiamat were each, considered the primordial first created spirit connected to the primordial waters, which represents the heavens and earth, being covered by sea waters and fresh waters, that have been mixed together, prior to the separation, between that of the fresh waters of rivers and lakes, and that of the salty seas. According to the Norse creation myth Immer the frost giant, would represent the fresh waters, whereby Buri which is buried in the salty ice block, would represent the sea waters in a frozen state. In the Norse creation myth, the fresh waters and salty waters have already been divided, unlike the Sumerian creation myth, whereby Tiamat the goddess of the salty waters and Abzu the god of fresh waters are connected at first and separates after they had given birth to the Anunnaki gods. The Anunnaki gods then kills Abzu their father of fresh waters, which is very similar in comparison to the Odin and his brothers killing their grandfather Immer also a god of fresh waters, referred to as a frost giant. They not only kill Immer but, make war on all of the frost giant's descendants which they tried to wipe out with a flood which was brought forth by the slaying of Immer. His blood supposedly became the seas of our planet. I hope, that you can hear and see so far, a connection, between the various, 
representations, of the birth or creation of our Milky Way galaxy, as it's been compared so far in this video presentation, to the Sumerian, Egyptian and Norse creation myths. I wish to move on to the connection, between the different mother goddesses, starting with the Sumerian mother goddess, and comparing her title, and descriptions, to the mother goddesses, which are her equivalent in the Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Norse and even Irish mythology. I will explain each of the mother goddesses under their own titles and according to their own mythology. So let's begin. I will begin my comparisons, between the various cultures, but with the same main deities, starting with the Sumerian mother goddess Ninkursag, and comparing her, to her equivalent, in the Hindu, Assyrian, Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Norse and Irish mythologies. Most people whom have heard of the Sumerian creation myth, would know that the name Ninkursag translates to the Lady of the Sacred Mountain. What is most astonishing about this mother goddess is, that not only, is she associated, and referred to the mother of the gods and man, but she is associated with the sacred mountain and the lady of the heavens, just as her counter mother goddess, Rhea from the Greek pantheon, and Cybele from the Roman pantheon. Ninharask was often depicted as one of the main or first seven creation deities, she was also often depicted in art, with an omega sign on her head, with what has been mistaken by scholars, as the Greek omega symbol. Many historians, and scholars, have based this claim, merely on her title as mother goddess, and goddess of fertility. Some have gone as far as to link this omega symbol with a woman's womb or umbilical cord of the mother. This is a false and fabricated claim, and in my own opinion, shows poor and lack of research. Anyone with eyes to see, and a mind to think for themselves, can clearly see, that her symbol depicted, in the layout of her hair or carved, into ancient sacred stones, does not show an omega symbol. A bit of research into ancient star maps, ancient sacred books regarding astrology and astronomy, would be able to tell one, what her symbol represent. Tell me, does this symbol associated with the mother goddess Ninkursag, look more like a Greek Omega symbol, or does it look more like a lyra, an ancient instrument, considered to be a harp, which one can play music on, and is associated with a specific constellation, known as the Lyra constellation. Or how about, this symbol here? Some pagans, Wiccans, astrologers and earth worshippers, would recognize this symbol, and know exactly what it represents. For those who, are not familiar with the astrology, astronomy, or the paths and relation of the moon to the earth, this is a symbol that represents the ascending, and descending lunar nodes, also known, as the north and south, lunar nodes of the moon, as it orbits around the earth. I must admit, I, myself is new to this, so therefore, I recommend clicking, on one of the links below, to lead you to an explanatory video of lunar nodes, if you wish to explore it further. I just recently came across it, whilst doing research on the symbol of Ninkursag, and thought, it looks far more similar, to her hair and symbol carved in the rocks, than the scholarly proposed Greek Omega symbol. But hey, I'm just an independent researcher, so what do I know? You're probably wondering, so what is my take on this? I believe that the Sumerian Lady of the Sacred Mountain, is representing an intelligent entity or spirit which is associated with either Mother Earth and her connection to the Moon, or perhaps her symbol as a little hint as to which constellation she was linked to or associated with. As you can see in this next image, I have here, there are various symbols depicted of the different Sumerian deities, it almost appear as if they are representing certain constellations in our heavens, such as Scorpius, Draco or even Hydra, and perhaps the constellation Lyra. Perhaps this image carved by the Sumerians, was trying to show, that these deities, were associated with certain star constellations. My research into the Lady of the Sacred Mountain, has her linked up with several other goddesses from various different religions and creation myths. Ninkursag, the Queen of Heaven, share many similarities such as titles, sacred animals, positions, and even symbols with the Mother Earth Goddess Gaia, Rhea, Parvati, Isis, Cybele, Frigga, Eryu, and Danu. I believe she has been worshipped in every other religion as the Mother Moon Goddess and therefore her symbol represents the ascending lunar node. She represents the first Mother Goddess, whom is the Mother of the Gods and just as astrology states that the North and South lunar nodes depicts our past and future, 
so too was she represented as the goddess with foresight of the future, like Frigga from Norse mythology, Rhea whom had knowledge of her son defeating the Titans. And is the queen of the mountain Olympus and the mother goddess Danu, whom is considered to be both, our earth mother goddess and is associated with the silvery moon as well as the path of the Milky Way. This brings us to the description, of a Didi, Didi, and Danu. The three daughters, of Daksha and wives of the sage Kashyapa. Kashyapa had many sons and daughters, but I want to, specifically focus on these three as they resemble certain classes of deities or beings that were on the earth in the pre- and post-flood world. According to the Hindu scriptures, Aditi was a primal mother goddess of the Hindu gods. Her name means boundless, limitless and infinite. She was personification of the sky and space which the gods reside in, and she was the mother of the celestial gods that lived in the sky, where Indra the equivalent of Zeus and Thor and Apollo the sun god resides. Or according to the Sumerian pantheon, and Lil and Utu. Aditi was also associated with time, and if my research is correct she is the equivalent of Rhea the mother of the gods and consort of Cronus known as Father Time, and god of the sky. In some Vedic hymn she she is mentioned as Prithvi, the supporter, or substratum of all. In other Hindu text, she is compared to a cow, as the provider of nourishment for all creatures. The Aditya are her solar sons whom were said to be either, 7, 8 or 12. Solar sons are also known as morning stars, and Lucifer according to the Bible was referred to as a morning star as well. Based on my latest research and my own understanding, the Aditya which were the sky gods, are the same as the Olympian gods of the Greek pantheon, and the same as the Aesir gods of Norse mythology as well as the same as the Anunnaki gods of the Sumerian pantheon, whose mother was said to be Ki, whom has also been linked with Ninkursag, the mother of the mountain. The Vishnu Purana describes her as the progenitor of human race, through whom she begot Vamana, an incarnation of Vishnu. In the Puranas, Aditi has an opponent in the form of Didi, the bound one, who is the mother of Datyas or Asuras, a type of demons. Next we have, the Hindu goddess Didi, she was the mother of the Asuras which are demi-gods, Deity is also referred to as demons and the Marudas which were violent and aggressive storm deities, that were described as having, golden lightning, and thunderbolt weapons. The Asuras were on the earth and not celestial gods. They did however make war on the sky gods from time to time. According to the Vedic mythology the Marats acted as Indra's companions and were a troop of young warriors often acquainted with the Ain Haryar and the wild hunt of Odin. They were also believed to be the offspring of Rudra, whom was a storm or wind deity. That was also associated with Vayu and the hunt. Here you can see from the Vedic text, the connection between Odin from Norse mythology, Rudra from the Vedic mythology, Typhon from the Greek mythology and Enlil from the Sumerian pantheon, and that they, may very well be the same deities. Depending upon the periodic situation, Rudra can mean the most severe roarer slash howler, such as a hurricane or tempest or the most frightening one. This name appears in the Shiva Sahasranama, and R. K. Sarma notes that it is used as a name of Shiva, often in later languages as well as Lord Vishnu. Therefore Rudra is the same triple deity as Brahma the creator, Vishnu the preserver and Shiva the destroyer. Just as Odin, Vili and Ve were the triple creation gods in the Norse creation myth. Another correlation between Odin and Rudra is the word Rudraksha, which in Sanskrit means the eye of Rudram was used as a name for both the berry of the Rudraksha tree, which is a evergreen tree and a name for a string of the prayer beads made from those seeds, similar to the rosemary used in Catholicism and Hindu prayers. Last we have Danu, another daughter of Daksha, sister to both Didi, mother of the sky gods and Aditi mother of the land demons. Danu is connected to the water deities, as you will soon begin to see. I believe Danu, was to the Sumerians Ninkursag, she was known as a land and fertility goddess, and the name Ninkursag, actually means Lady of the Sacred Mountain. We know that Rhea from Greek, Sibel from Roman, Frigga from Norse and Isis from Egyptian mythology, were known as Mother Goddesses, Lady of the Mountain, the Queen of Heaven, as well as associated with magic, divination, and fertility. It was believed by scholars, that, from the early 5th century the Greeks were introduced to Kubel, from Anatolia, Pindar, where she was known as Mistress Sibel the Mother. In the Homeric hymn 14, she is considered, 
the mother of all gods and all human beings. Sibel was readily assimilated with several Greek goddesses, especially Rhea, as Meter Theon mother of the gods and even Gaia. Is it just a coincidence that, Ninkursog was also referred to as Lady of the Sacred Mountain, a mother goddess that was the mother of the gods, as well as responsible for the creation of mankind. Dot Ninkursog is among the most likely candidates for the original Mother Earth figure, developing from Namu, and Ki, as she is associated with fertility, growth, transformation, creation, pregnancy, childbirth, and nurture. Frigga from Norse mythology, is another mother goddess, and queen of the Aesinjur. She too was a witch and could see into the future. She was considered to be of the Jotun and a giantess. Frigga was the daughter of Furgan, which was also referred to as Jord, and is an ancient Norse name for Earth. Therefore Frigga is a titanus daughter of Gaia, which is the Earth, or even Geb. Geb was the male version of Earth according to ancient Egyptian creation myth. Rhea too, was a titanus and daughter of the Earth and Sky which were known to the Greeks as Gaia and Uranus. And Ninkursog too, was a daughter of the Sky Father Anu, and Earth Mother Ki, and therefore, one of the Anunnaki. Frigga is also associated with water just as Danu is. Frigga actually had a domain of her own, known as Fensal, also known as Hall of Mists, Sea Halls, or Marsh Halls, and is associated, with the marshlands. Funny enough, in the Enuma Elish creation story, Apsu the god of fresh water, and Tiamat the goddess of salty waters, gave birth to a set of primordial twins, known as Lamu and Lahamu, which are associated with silt, sand and wet clay, much like mud lakes, and dry land, found around riverbanks. These primordial twins, then gave birth to Ansar and Kisar, which are also known as Anu and Ki. So you can see how Frigga a titanus daughter of the marshlands can be connected with Kisar. It was believed, that Ninkursog was also an aspect of Ki, representing a mother, earth goddess, and was the consort of Anu and Ansar which I have connected with Odin to the Norse, Osiris to the Egyptians, Saturn to the Romans, and Diane Kesh to the Irish pantheon of pagan deities. As for Danu, woe is this elusive character, that both the Hindu religion, and the Irish Celts considered to be, a primordial earth and water goddess. Let's look at the Hindu origins of this goddess first. According to the Rigveda, Danu is a primordial goddess of water. It is believed by many scholars that Danu which means flow represents the primordial waters and that this goddess embodied these waters. Some scholars and theologians have connected her with the Danube River, the Euphrates, the Don, the Dnieper and Dniester. She was the daughter of the Daksha, sister to Aditi, Didi and even Kadru the mother of all the Nagas, which were serpentine deities. The spouse of Danu was Kashyapa the so-called enlightened sage, which is very similar, if not identical to the masquerading, ascended masters of the New Age philosophy. Their children were known as the Danavas, and they were often referred to as the enemy of Aditi's children known as the Devas, which were the celestial gods. You could refer to them as the Utun of Norse mythology and the Fomorians of the Irish mythology which were the enemy of the Tuatha de Danan. One of the more, famously known Danavas, was Vritra a serpent demon, whose name means enveloper. He was the adversary of Indra, which I will equate with Thor, rather than Zeus, to be honest, as Thor too, was a god of thunder and weather, and often battled with Jormungandr, the world serpent and child of Loki and Angerboda the Iron Witch. It is not hard to see, how Danu could be considered a witch and therefore was able to give birth to a serpent demon, as witches have the ability to shapeshift into various animals and forms. Kashyapa was considered a mind-born son of Brahma, and therefore had no parents or natural birth. It is clear to see that he was no ordinary man living on the earth, but indeed a fallen angel, living on the earth as a man, having sexual relations with mortal woman, and bore children by them. Not sure if Kashyapa could shapeshift into animals, but I know that he was considered a seer, who has attained wisdom and enlightenment and became a teacher much like the ascended masters of the Luciferian doctrine. Kasyap or Kashyap, means turtle in Sanskrit. A well-known philosopher and teacher of philosophy called Fritz Stahl agrees that Kasyapa means tortoise but believes that it is a non-Indo-European word. According to the Tamil language Kacham also means turtle, 
the Egyptians equated their god Set with a turtle and in Mesopotamia the god Ea which is Enki to the Sumerians was also associated with a tortoise. Is that a coincidence or a connection between all these religions? Meanings and history of the name Danae. Dani was a figure of an ancient Greek myth. She was the daughter of Eurydice, the king of Argos and was the mother of Perseus. His father was Zeus who came to her disguised as a shower of gold. Pronounced, Danae or Dana, English, Danae, Latin, and Danae, modern Greek. Hebrew meaning, God is my judge. Tale of Danae and Zeus. Danae was the only child of Acrisius and Eurydice, the ruling couple of Argos, and as she grew up, Danae gained a reputation, of being the most beautiful female mortal, of the age. Being a Chryseus only child, caused the king a problem, for this meant that he, had no male offspring to leave his kingdom to. A Chryseus therefore, consulted an oracle to find out, what the future would behold, and specifically, whether Danae would ever have a son, who could rule Argos after a Chryseus. The prophecy offered up by the oracle, though hardly said, a Chryseus mind at rest, for although Danae was destined, to bear a male heir for the king, that son was then destined to kill King Acrisius. Acrisius' priorities now changed, from being worried about whom to pass his kingdom on to, the king was now worried about his own mortality. And so he built a bronze tower underground, and locked his daughter up in it, so that no man could impregnate her, and the prophecy would not come to pass. As Danae was locked in her tower, with only a little window to peep through, for air and sunlight, the beauty and dire situation, of this princess was noticed, by the king of the god Zeus. Zeus was capable of changing form, into various animals, creatures, other gods and even objects, to fulfill his lustful desires, and yet again he lusted after Danae. It is stated in the myth of Danae, that Zeus entered her tower prison through an opening in the ceiling, disguised as a golden rain, whether he was able, to impregnate her, while in this form or he took on a shape of a man, is anyone's guess, as the so-called myth only states that Zeus impregnated her, and she became pregnant with a demigod son, a hero of renown as stated in Genesis 6. Perseus, a hero, whom fought many battles against mythical monsters, chimeras, and even the Gorgon, Naga-type being, Medusa. Medusa is even mentioned in the Testament of Solomon, so as far as myths go, this was a real hybrid demonic offspring creature, that existed, who was killed by the son of Zeus called Perseus. When King Acrisius finally checked on his daughter, he happened to find her with child, and so he made a casket, which he placed Danae and her baby, Perseus into, and cast them into the sea. Zeus asked Poseidon, god of the sea, to steer the casket to safety, and they ended up being rescued and taken in, by a fisherman named Dictus, the brother of Polydectes, that was the king of Seraphos. King Polydectes, fell in love with Danae, but she always had the protection of her demigod son Perseus, that would fight of the advances of Polydectes on his mother. One day the king proclaimed his marriage of another bride, and it was the custom of his people to bring wedding gifts. Perseus, had nothing to give, but offered up his services, stating he will do anything the king asked him to do, as payment for the wedding gift, Polydectes requested the head of Medusa, and so Perseus went on a quest to cut of the head of this snake-haired monster, borrowing a few items from the gods of Olympus. After he succeeded, in cutting of and presenting the head of Medusa to the king, the king turned to stone, as this was one of the powers Medusa had, to turn anyone into stone with just one glare. Feeling remorse and shame for having killed the king of Seraphos, Perseus ran away, ending up back in Argos, his grandfather in the meantime flee to Thessaly and during the funeral games held in Larissa, Perseus partook in the disgust game, and accidentally killed his grandfather Acrisius, when he threw the disgust, thus fulfilling the prophecy of the oracle. Surely you can begin to see, the connections and similarities, between these various, and distant religions, from the past. But if you are still not convinced, then I would like to draw your attention, away from the Greek hero Perseus, and towards the Celtic hero or god Lug. You see, like Danae's father, a Chryseus that locked her in a tower due to keeping her a virgin, so that she brings forth no son that can kill him and take his kingdom, lose mother Iton underwent the same fate by her father Balor. Balor was said to be a giant with three eyes. 
one was called the evil eye that can cause destruction, believed to be in the middle of his head, like a cyclops. Perhaps where one's third eye or mind's eye analogy comes from. Anyways, Balor the king of the Fomorians, too locked his virgin daughter in a bronze tower, in hope that the prophecy of the oracle never comes to pass. Like the Chryseus, he too was destined to die at the hands of his grandson. Kian, whom also had two brothers like Zeus, managed to get into her locked tower, with the help from Byroke, his fairy godmother, he impregnates Aiton and the next time her father checks in on her, she is found with three babies, which King Balor, then gives to a messenger, to drown in a whirlpool. One of the babes, he drops in the harbor, and it is rescued by the fairy queen, that takes love to his father. He is then handed to his brother, to be fostered, called Gavita, that also happens to be, a metalsmith like Hephaestus, the god of fire, whom grafted weapons for the gods. From Gavita, he learns the skill, of a smith. As a young man, Lug travels to Terra in Ireland, to join the Tuatha de Danann's court. The king at this time, was Nuada, and like the Norse god Tur, he was a god of war and justice. The king of the Tuatha de Danann, would not accept anyone to join his court, if they did not have a special skill, to serve him with. Lug joins the kingdom on account, of having many skills combined. His skills were the following. He offers his services as a right, a smith, a champion, a swordsman, a harpist, a hero, a poet, historian, a sorcerer, and a craftsman, and for that he was appointed as chief alum of Ireland. Now I am going to show you the description of this Celtic god Lug. Keep in mind, that this god Lug was considered a sun god, but this has proven to be an incorrect, description of this Celtic god, for his name and association, had a lot more to do with, light, such as daylight rather than sunlight, also lightning and even storms were associated with this god of light. Not only, was he associated with harvests, rain, lightning, and sorcery, but he was also considered, a babbler, cunning, a poet, psychopomp, entertainer, court jester, smith and musician, and like his equal in Norse mythology, he was heralded as both a savior and trickster of the gods. It was also, believed that the god Lug, was the inventor of the chess game, ball games, and even horse racing. As for his physical appearance, is the following, taken from various Celtic mythology. In the brief narrative by Lay and Skyil, Lu is described as being very large and very beautiful and also as a spear-wielding horseman. When he appears before the wounded Ku Hulan, he is described as follows. A man fair and tall, with a great head of curly yellow hair. He has a green mantle, wrapped about him, and a brooch of white silver, in the mantle over his breast. Next to his white skin, he wears a tunic, of royal satin, with red gold insertion, reaching to his knees. He carries a black shield, with a hard boss of white bronze. In his hand, a five-pointed spear, and next to it a forked javelin. Elsewhere Lu is described as a tall young man with bright red cheeks, white sides, a bronze-colored face and blood-colored hair. Both these physical descriptions of the Celtic, god of light, Lug, can be applied to Loki from Norse mythology, Hermes from Greek mythology and Mercury from Roman mythology. But, this is not the only connection, between these four distant demigods. I can show you numerous other connections, such as the name of Lug and Loki. Starting with Lug. Many scholars believe and speculate, that the name Lug is associated with two things, those two things are, light and oath. Some scholars propose that it derives from a suggested Proto-Indo-European root, Lu meaning to bind by oath compare Old Irish Luis and Welsh LLW, both meaning oath, vow, active swearing and derived from a suffixed, Proto-Celtic form, Lugio, oath which suggests, that he was originally a god who swore in oaths. When the Fomorian king Balor, met Lug in the second battle of Moitra, he calls Lu a babbler. In the past his name was generally believed to come from another suggested Proto-Indo-European root look and even Lux which means flashing light, and he has many characteristics in common, with the swift Hermes who was fast as lightning, and the messenger as well as, at times, vizier of the gods, and the trickster god Loki. Once you begin, to see all these connections, and connect the dots yourself, you begin to see, that they may very well, be the same deities worshipped in all of these ancient cultures, and religions, regardless of the distance, 
and time frame they were worshipped in, or whatever appearance they appeared as. The name Lug, is not only associated with oaths, but it also means to bind, make an oath, just as Loki's name does. In fact Lug was a descendant of the Tua had to Danan through his father Kian Said and also a descendant of the Fomorians, through his mother whom was the daughter of the Fomorian King Balor. Many people think that both the parents of Loki were frost giants or of the Utun, there isn't much information regarding Loki's parents, but do keep in mind, that Zeus could transform into objects, and even other gods, he once took on the form of Poseidon to seduce a female. It is not unlikely for Zeus to take on the form of the Utun to get what he wants. With that being said, if we go way back to the beginning of the Norse mythology, I will inform you, that Odin's parents called Bor and Besla were also half and half. What I mean by this statement, is Bor was a son of Buri, the first godlike man that came into being from the first creation of our world, also inside him there was Immer the frost giant whom had many offspring. Buri had only one offspring known as the son Bor, the first Aesir god, he married a daughter of Weimar, Besla, which would have been a Jotun wife of Bor, and their children were the three brothers Odin, Villa and Ve, the first triple Aesir creator gods. Perhaps Loki's parents were both descendants of Immer the frost giant, and therefore both were Utun. Odin is related to Immer his grandfather, just as Loki was related to Immer and so Loki joins the Aesir on account of his relations to Odin the king of the Aesir, but Loki did not join the Aesir when Odin was king but when the Norse god Tur ruled the Aesir as king, just as the Celtic god Lug joins the Tuatha de Danann, when Nuada is king of the Tuatha de Danann. In various poems from the poetic Edda, stanza 2 of Lokasena, stanza 41 of Hindlaljoth, and stanza 26 of Fjallsvinsmal, and sections of the prose Edda, such as chapter 32 of Jilfaginning, stanza 8 of Hauslong, and stanza 1 of Thor's Drapa Loki is alternatively referred to as Lopter, which is generally considered to be derived, from Old Norse Lopt meaning air, and therefore points to an association with the air. Many scholars also associate Loki with not only light but fire too. The name Thrunger Old Norse for Roar, is also used in reference to Loki, Loki was a trickster, his name has to do with loops, locks as he always gets the gods tangled up in something and has to get them out of it, by his cunning wit. Loki and Odin are also sworn blood brothers, as when Loki joined the Aesir gods, he and Odin made a blood pact and became blood brothers. This means they swore an oath to accept Loki which is half Fomorian or shall I say Jotun and half Aesir descent and therefore he was also a shapeshifter, skilled in sorcery, the arts, cunningness and so forth. Loki is not a god or a direct son of god, such as the morning stars like Lucifer, Zeus, Poseidon which I will show you is the same as Enlil and Enki, from the Sumerian pantheon. Loki is a demigod, he is an offspring of the Jotun, the frost giants and therefore a shape-shifting Nephilim. During my research into the books of Enoch, I came across an angel, that was sent to Enoch, to cool down his face, as he had just been. Face to face, with the Creator, and his face glowed, like a hot furnace, due to the bright glory of God. This angel that was sent to Enoch had hands as white as snow and was as cold as ice and was of enormous size. Immediately it made me think of the frost giants of Norse mythology. You see, as far-fetched as it may sound. When Satanael an archangel and his followers started an uprising in heaven against Michael and his angels, and God banished them to the earth, they not only brought a lot of their heavenly knowledge, wisdom and skills with them, but they also, brought the stories of the creation of their world, their kingdoms, and the things that happened there. With that being said that Snow White, cold as ice angel that met with Enoch may have been created to be a frost giant angelic being and may very well be one of the loyal frost giant angels, that did not side with Satan, and therefore was not banished to the earth like others in the same group of angels could have been. You would be surprised to learn about the different classes, groups and types of angels that the Creator has created and they each in their rank have a specific purpose, duty and skill. So now that we have discussed, the Heavenly Mother of the Gods, in the Sumerian, Vedic, Greek, Roman and Celtic text. Let's turn back to the gods themselves, all the way back to what scholars claim is the beginning of civilization and the oldest writings in the world, the Sumerian text. I will discuss some of the Sumerian text in detail, straight from their own translations and you can decide on whether these so-called gods are the same in every culture and religion. The 
The following Sumerian text translations come straight from the renowned authors, historians, and Sumerian research scholars, which has been translated into English and published online by the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature website, which is based at the University of Oxford. Their aim for creating the Electronic Text Corpus website is to make accessible, via the World Wide Web, over 400 literary works composed in the Sumerian language. These ancient Sumerian text translations are regularly updated and more works is added to the electronic text, as scholars translate more of the ancient Sumerian clay tablets. Anyone that is interested in reading the ancient Sumerian text online can easily read through over 400 translated Sumerian literature works, which varies between poetry, hymns, laments, songs, prayers, fables, didactic praise poems, debate poems and proverbs that has been reconstructed, during the past 50 years, from thousands of fragmentary clay tablets, inscribed in cuneiform writing, and which, dates between, 2100 to about 1650 BC. The website to the electronic text corpus of Sumerian literature can be found in the credit section under the description and title of this video. So let's take a look at a few of these scholarly translated ancient Sumerian literature. The first Sumerian literature work, we are going to look at is a hymn that was dedicated, to a city called Nibiru and its builder called Ishmandagan. It is titled and translated into the following English lines. A hymn to Nibiru and Ishmdagan, Ishmdagan W, translation. Segment A. City whose terrifying splendor, extends over heaven and earth, whose towers are exceptionally grand, shrine Nibiru. Your power reaches to the edges of the uttermost extent of heaven and earth. Of all the brick buildings, erected in the land, your brickwork, is the most excellent. You have allowed all the foreign lands, and as many cities as are built, to receive excellent divine powers. Your name is as excellent, as your excellent divine powers. Your soil is soil as good as your name. City, your divine powers tower, over heaven and earth. You are the pillar, in the south and the uplands, the mooring post of all people. Your divine powers are supreme divine powers, with which no divine powers can compare. You are a lofty hill that no one can reach. Outstanding, with head high, you reach to the heavens. Your interior towers up, and your exterior is awesome. You were built as life-giving food for the Anuna gods, you were beautified for their eating and drinking. City, your interior is holy, your exterior is radiant. Your body exudes terrifying splendor. Your location is a well-chosen location. The Lord of Wisdom, and Lil, the great mountain has built a sanctuary in your midst. That sanctuary is a lapis lazuli sanctuary, a sanctuary that can decide destinies. Segment C. Nibru, no god excels like your lord and lady, they are powerful princes, brilliantly revealed deities. No god excels like Enlil and Ninlil, they are powerful princes, lords who can decide destinies. Nibru, your holy songs are exceptionally precious, surpassing all praise. I, Ikmi Dagan, have put them in everyone's mouth for all time. Another translated Sumerian text written about Enlil, Ninlil and the city they lived in called Nibiru. Notice Nibiru sounds an awful lot like Nibiru. In fact, the only difference between Nibiru and Nibiru is an added I in between the B and R of Nibiru. From the Sumerian text titled Enlil and Ni. 1 to 12. There was a city, there was a city, the one we live in. Nibiru was the city, the one we live in. Durgiz Ninbar was the city, the one we live in. Itsala is its holy river, Karjastina is its key. Karasar is its key where boats make fast. Pulal is its freshwater well. Idnumbertum is its branching canal, and if one measures from there, its cultivated land is 50 sar each way. Enlil was one of its young men, and Ninlil was one of its young women. Nunbar Segunu was one of its wise old women. At that time the maiden was advised by her own mother, Ninlil was advised by Nunbar Segunu, the river is holy, woman. The river is holy, don't bathe in it. Ninlil, don't walk along the bank of the Idnumber Tum. His eye is bright, the Lord's eye is bright, he will look at you. The great mountain, Father Enlil, his eye is bright, he will look at you. The shepherd who decides all destinies, his eye is bright, he will look at you. Straight away he will want to have intercourse, he will want to kiss. He will be happy to pour lusty semen into the womb, and then he will leave you to it. 22-34 she advised her from the heart, she gave wisdom to her. The river is holy, the woman bathed in the holy river. 
As Ninlil walked along the bank of the id number tum, his eye was bright, the Lord's eye was bright, he looked at her. The great mountain, Father Enlil, his eye was bright, he looked at her. The shepherd who decides all destinies, his eye was bright, he looked at her. The king said to her, I want to have sex with you, but he could not make her let him. And Lil said to her, I want to kiss you, but he could not make her let him. My vagina is small, it does not know pregnancy. My lips are young, they do not know kissing. If my mother learns of it, she will slap my hand. If my father learns of it, he will lay hands on me. But right now, no one will stop me from telling this to my girlfriend. Not only is Nibru a city and not a planet, but Enlil is lusting after a beautiful maiden that lived in the city Nibru and the great mountain god Enlil approached the young maiden Enlil and groomed her to have intercourse with her. So here is already the connection between the sons of God, that lusted after the young mortal maidens on the earth, just as Zeus lusted after many females, some were goddesses, nymphs, naiads, and even mortal human maidens. But that is not all, let's continue this connection between Zeus the Lord and his lady Ninlil, Hep becomes his wife and co-ruler of the city Nibiru. There is no Sumerian text that states the planet Nibiru is the abode of the gods. Or that they even descended to earth from a rogue planet called Nibiru. There is however countless translated Sumerian literature in the form of hymns, praise poems, descriptions and so forth stating that Nibiru was the abode of the gods, but it was in fact a magnificent brick-built city on the earth, which height reach into the heavens. And at the top of a lofty hill, which could also translate, to mountain lived the Anunnaki gods. This here is a big enough comparison of the Olympian gods living on Mount Olympus, the Aesir gods living in Asgard, or even Mount Kailash, where it was also believed by the Tibetan monks, to be the abode of the gods, especially Lord Krishna. With that being said many scholars have equated the planet of the crossing with the planet Jupiter, and we all know that planet Jupiter or Jupiter itself was associated with Zeus the god of Olympus. One of the scholars of Sumerian text is Professor Langdon and According to Langdon, Sumerian and Semitic religious and historical texts from 1923, it states that Nibiru, the planet of the crossing, refers to the intersection of the celestial equator, and the ecliptic by which they measured, using planet Jupiter as a point reference, to measure the planets which cross from the southern to the northern part of the way of Anu, and vice versa. With this being said, Nibiru the planet of the crossing was referring to planet Jupiter and not a twelfth rogue planet hiding or entering into our solar system. Makes sense now when you think about Langdon's statement about Nibiru, aka Nippur depicting the planet of the crossing Jupiter where Enlil was their primary god. Perhaps now, it is much clearer to see, how Zeus is connected, with planet Jupiter, and even Enlil of the Sumerian pantheon. It was believed by the ancient Sumerians, that Enlil was the first ruling god of the air, he was also the supreme god, worshipped in ancient Samaria and Babylon, before Marduk, the son of Enki, replaced Enlil, as the head of the Sumerian and Babylonian pantheon. Zeus is not even a Greek name, in fact most of the Greek gods and demigod names, have their origin in the Indo-European language. The meaning for the name Zeus, is Deus, which means God, or Lord, and therefore it is just stating that Zeus is a deity and it is not his actual name. He was a deity, worshipped in Phoenicia, and Canaan as Baal, which means Lord. In the biblical scriptures, there are some passages, that refer to Yahweh, the God of the Bible as Lord. In the book of Enoch, it also refers to the Creator, as Lord of Spirits. The name Lord, was often applied by the ancient civilizations, to the deity, that they believed, was their supreme God, and their Creator. Sometimes their rulers and kings, were deified as gods, and were referred to as Lord, which would have been the name Baal, and therefore their rulers, were deified into gods. It doesn't mean the deity or ruler, that they revered as Lord, or in their language as Baal, and worshipped as their supreme God, is the same Creator God, in the scripture called Yahweh. Many people, who do not understand this title, given to both deities and rulers on the earth, often mistake the name Baal for God, and especially, associate this title, with the God of the Bible. Baal is not a name, any more than Zeus is, Baal was more like a title, and is just another name for Lord, which actually means the supreme or head ruler. It does not mean, the supreme creator, or God of the Bible, any more, than Lord Mountbatten, which is a member of the British royal family as a God, or better yet, is the same as the creator God Yahweh, and Lord of Spirits, 
referred to in the scriptures and the book of Enoch. With that being said, let's take a look at the other connection, between Zeus, the supreme god, and lord of the air, father god to the Greek, and Roman civilization, and Baal the supreme god and ruler of the Canaanite and Phoenician civilization. Ever heard of Baalbek? Baalbek is an ancient Phoenician city, located in what is now, modern-day Lebanon, which lies north of Beirut, in the Bekaa Valley. It has been inhabited, as early as 9000 BCE. Baalbek, is also the location, where one of the biggest temples were built, and dedicated, to the the Roman god Jupiter. Jupiter is the same supreme god of the Romans as Zeus is to the Greeks and therefore he is the same sky god, supreme ruler of the gods, and god of fertility, weather and especially lightning. He was also revered as a sun god, but I will deal with that part in the follow-up video. Just by the fact, that the biggest temple, at Baalbek, was, dedicated to their supreme god Jupiter, one can already see, how Zeus aka Jupiter is synonymous, with Baal Hadad, as well as Set, the Egyptian god of storms, and Enlil, the first supreme god, to the ancient Sumerians. Baal had a consort known as the Queen of Heaven, called Astarte, much like the Egyptian god Set, who is also a god associated with storms and the weather. But that is not the only connection between Zeus, Jupiter, Baal, and Lil and Set. I will show you an older connection, and perhaps the reason, why Baal became the supreme god of the ancient Phoenicians and Canaanites. Let's take a look, at the origins of Phoenicia first, as this will make a lot more sense, in piecing together, how Zeus is connected with Baal at ancient Phoenicia, Canaan and even ancient Egypt. According to Greek mythology, when Europa was carried off by Zeus, her three brothers, were sent out by Agenor their father, to find her, but the search was unsuccessful. Phoenix her brother, eventually settled in a country in Asia, which he named Phoenicia after himself. So according to this Greek myth, Phoenix was a son of Agenor, and according to Apollodorus, Agenor was born in Memphis of Egypt, to Poseidon in Libya, and he had a twin brother named Belus. Belus remained in Egypt and reigned over Egypt, while Agenor departed to Phoenicia, and reigned there. According to other sources, Agenor, was the son of Belus, and possibly a Kiroi, a Naiad. Although the sources differ, as to Agenor's children, he is sometimes said to have been the father of Cadmus, Europa, Silix, Phoenix, and Thassus. Some sources state that Phoenix was Agenor's brother, and Belus's son, and it was Phoenix who was the father of these individuals. Agenor's wives, is variously given as Telephassa, Argiope, and Tyro, with the latter giving her name to the city of Tyre. If the latter is the true account, then this next bit of background info, I have copied from Wikipedia would make a lot of sense, as it states, that the city Tyre, which is in Lebanon, was one of the earliest Phoenician metropolises, and the legendary birthplace, of Europa, and her brothers Cadmus and Phoenix. Even though, many of these Greek M Roman and Phoenician sources differ, on who exactly is the father and who is the son, the one thing they do have in common, is linking both, Agenor, and Phoenix, to the city Tyre and Phoenicia and Lebanon, as well as Canaan, and even Egypt, as Agenor was the demigod son of Poseidon and his mortal lover, Libya, which was a Libyan princess from ancient Egypt. Well so far I have shown yo, you how Phoenix is related to Agenor, believed to be a son of Poseidon, which is the brother of Zeus and and whose mother was an Egyptian princess, from which the name of modern Libya, in North Africa originated from. I am yet to show you, how they are connected with Zeus the supreme sky god. So how is Phoenix related or connected with Zeus you may ask? Phoenix was a son of Agenor, and Agenor a son of Poseidon and Libya. Libya was an Egyptian princess and her father was Epiphus, king of Egypt which was a son of Zeus, and husband too, Cassiope, or Memphis, which was the mother of Libya. According to Roman mythology, Libya married Neptune, a foreigner of much power, whose real name is unknown. Libya and Neptune had a son called Busiris, who became a brutal tyrant of Upper Egypt, and has been connected with Osiris from Egypt. Epiphus the grandfather of Busiris or Osiris, was an Egyptian king and called Apis. Apis, the bull of Memphis, was worshipped as a god in Egypt, and was also associated with other deities, such as Ptah, the god of Memphis, and Osiris. 
By now, you can clearly see the connection, between Zeus, Poseidon, their lovers and their children, which became the first god kings of Egypt, Phoenicia, Canaan, and descended into the lineage of the kings of the first Greeks, and Roman dynasties. It is not hard to see how all of these kings, founders and rulers of the ancient cities, such as Phoenicia and Baalbek trace back to the descendants of not only Zeus but his brother Poseidon too, which in my next video will show their origins beginning in ancient Sumer as Enlil and Enki. I trust that you, can now see these connections, for yourself, between all of these ancient, civilizations, their main religions and their rulership on the earth, that was often passed on, from their immortal fathers, to their demigod sons. These god kings, began with the likes, of the heroes of renown, as the Bible call them, the Nephilim sons of the Watchers. From Greek mythology, it is clear to see, who these hero sons, demigod kings, and founders of many cities, towns, countries, temples and places were. By just looking at the legends and rulership of the Greeks kings and heroes, and tracing the Greek god's family tree, it is not hard to see, how almost all the ancient kings from ancient dynasties, were connected to the gods and kings of Egypt, Phoenicia, Babylon, then Asia, Greece, Rome, and eventually the whole of Europe. The Book of Enoch, goes into detail, about the 200 watchers, these are the children of heaven, the sons of God, and yes they are angels, not extraterrestrials, or ancient astronauts from Nibiru, which descended to the earth in the sixth generation of humans, that was living on the earth, these humans were much more advanced than science give them credit for. They were not as prehistoric as they claim they were. They were in fact much bigger, smarter and lived a lot longer than modern man today, and these watchers left their own domains of the supernatural realms in the sky, and descended to earth, and had chosen wives for themselves from amongst, the daughters of mankind, as they wanted to experience the physical act of sex and have offspring of their own. All those gods and goddesses spoken of in mythology have had children, but they did not have them through the same physical sexual act between a man and woman, which is why they changed their appearances into that of flesh and blood and united themselves sexually, with mortal man and woman, engaging in all manners of sexual acts, some with even animals and any other creature that they could transform themselves into, such as Loki which changed himself into a mare and gave birth to Odin's eight-legged horse. These mortal woman and angels mistaken for gods, cohabit on the earth, and had offspring, these were two completely different species of a mortal race and an immortal godlike race, which sexually interacted and begot children, that was one part human, and one part divine. Though they were flesh, they, were very large and possessed other skills, occult knowledge, and supernatural abilities, which mortals do not have, and therefore, they were appointed by their godly fathers, to rule as kings, built cities and, instruct ordinary man and woman in the forbidden arts, such as divination, spells, sorcery, and built civilizations on the earth. If anyone took the time, to read about ancient mythology, you soon begin to see the patterns, of the two main candidates, which interacted with mankind on the earth, and had semi-divine children, with their mortal lovers, their offspring became heroes of renown, rulers, kings and princes on the earth, and were responsible for teaching mankind, about things such as agriculture, plowing, farming, astrology, pharmacia, herbs, magic, and keeping time with the sun, moon and stars, but above all, they taught humanity, various rituals, on how to honor their fathers, the gods and the kings of the past, and to this day paganism exists. And as you can see by this chart, I have linked up, which gods and goddesses were worshipped, as the deities which ruled or were associated, with the sun, moon and planets, in the main six ancient civilizations. In my next video, which would be the continuation of the children of Odin, I will be showing more connections between Enlil and Zeus, Enki and Poseidon and even Inanna and Aphrodite, and show you how these three became the center point and basis of all other pagan religions that followed them all the way back, starting in ancient Sumer. I will also be showing many connections between the sun, and moon deities that were worshipped in every pagan religion, and especially the Tuahad de Danan, the Fey folk and their connection to ascended masters and the teachings of the mystery schools. I hope you have enjoyed seeing all these connections for yourself, and if for any reason you may think I am making any of this up, and has no basis for truth, I friendly invite you, to check out the links in the description, to see if these connections add up. I have nothing to gain to lie to you, and my only intention for making these videos, 
is to connect the dots for you and reveal the full picture, once all the missing puzzle pieces have been pieced together. Thank you for watching, and please return for the rest of this video. God bless and continue to shed some light for others in this dark winter that we are entering. To be continued.